Let's just bow our heads in prayer again. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, humbly to ask you, Lord, to bless us with your presence this morning and to speak to our hearts those things you want us to learn and understand about our relationship with you. These things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to read this morning from Joshua chapter 14, from verse 6 to 15. Joshua chapter 14, from verse 6 to verse 15. It's a story of a, a couple of friends over many years and a conversation uh, that they have between themselves. And from verse 6 I read, then, then the children of Judah came to Joshua and Gilgal, and Caleb, Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him, and it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance, and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. And he said, These forty-five years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now, here I am this day, eighty-five years old. As yet I am as strong this, this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now, therefore... Give me this mountain, of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard in that day how, Ab how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will, uh, will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, to this day. Because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron was formerly Kijath Abba. Abba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. Anyone ever had a kaleidoscope in their younger years? People know what a kaleidoscope is? Yeah? Anyone owned one? No? Oh, some of you have, good. The kaleidoscope is one of those tubes which has all these coloured glass at the end and some mirrors inside. When you hold it up to the light and you rotate it, you get this explosion of colours and different patterns uh, that come out. And every new rotation gives you a different pattern. It's like when you hold up a diamond to a light and you get the right angle, it's just an explosion of colour from that diamond. And God's word is very much like that. And this morning, I want us to look at faith from this particular angle and the explosion of colour that God's word gives it because when you talk of faith and we've had many sermons about faith over the years we pick a particular aspect of faith and sometimes we flatten the word to mean only what we have in that particular message but faith is such a broad word and it en encompasses every aspect of our lives in so many different ways and in this chapter, this passage that we read, I want us to look at the faith of these two men. This is a conversation between two friends that goes back a very long way. It was 45 years earlier that Caleb refers to this, uh, this instruction from Moses that they went into the promised land, that Caleb would inherit the mountains where Anakim, the Anakim lived. But this journey for both of these men, this journey of faith began a lot earlier before them and this journey of faith continues still today for each of us that have a faith in Jesus Christ. And I say a faith in Jesus Christ because the word faith means different things to different people. This journey for them was really to learn to trust in God's faithfulness 
So this morning I'm not going to talk about the faith required for salvation, to believe in Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for our sins. And in the shedding of his blood, our sins are washed, washed away. We're forgiven. We have new life in Jesus Christ. We use those words and faith is one aspect that's important to our salvation. It's very important to our salvation. Make, make no mistake about that. So I'm not going to deal with that aspect of faith this morning. We've dealt with that many times and we will again many times in the future. But the faith I want us to deal with here is the faith that, faith that says, I trust in God's faithfulness. What God said he will do, I believe that he will do it. When God promises something, then God keeps his promise. And to have faith in God's promises means I believe that God will keep his promise. The conversation between these two guys, as I said, started a lot earlier. It started with Abraham's call to leave the land that he lived in for some unknown land that God was going to show him. I have no idea who would do that today. You'd leave what you know for some unknown land. But faith, God's, uh, Abraham's faith in God, to trust God's faithfulness, meant for Abraham, well, God knows what he's doing and I'm going to trust that he knows what he's doing and he's going to take me to a land that he's promised. And all through Israel's history, we have this aspect of them looking forward to the promised land. And the call for them to trust God that he would take them to this promised land. And to the promised land, the Israelites got. They were in Egypt for 400 years. The last 40 of those 400 years, Joshua and Caleb were around. And they experienced what it meant to live in slavery for those 400 years in Egypt. And they saw how God intervened. And they trusted God. It was difficult for Moses to convince the Israelites to trust that God was going to bring them out. But that's what their whole history and everything they were taught pointed to, that God would come and would deliver them and take them to the promised land. And so those 400 years of uh, slavery in Egypt end with God's miraculous deliverance of the Israelites. We call that the Exodus, the ten plagues, and everything that God had done for the Israelites to... Uh, humble Pharaoh to let them go and they left the promised land, they entered the desert and it was a short trip sorry, they left Egypt they entered the desert, it was a short trip to the promised land and what they needed to cross the Jordan River was to trust God, at every point in their lives they had to learn to trust God what was needed at this point was that they trusted God and were able to cross the river into the promised land See, it wasn't enough for God and for the Israelites to reflect and say, oh, we're not in Egypt anymore, that's great. Let's hang around in the desert. And it wasn't enough for the Israelites and for God, for Israel, to sit on the banks of the Jordan River and look across and say, yep, we can see the promised land. The destination wasn't the desert and the destination wasn't the banks of the Jordan River. The destination that God had for them was the promised land. And the entry into the promised land was not automatic. They had to trust that God would be able to take them across into the promised land and drive out all the enemies. I mean, that's what God said. No one will be able to stand against you. I will be with you. I will fight the battles for you. No one will be able to stand against you. And they had to trust God would do that in order to enter the promised land. So it's not enough for us to know about sin and hell and what salvation is, and what God's word says, and how broken the world around us is, and how broken we are, you don't need faith to know all those things. You need to be exposed to some Christian sort of influence in your life, and you get to understand and those concepts. You might not believe them, but you don't need faith to know them. You don't need faith to know there's a heaven and a hell. But you need faith to be able to translate yourself from the current existence that we have today to the existence that God has for us in this new life that he's created for us, which we call the new life, the life of faith and the life of hope. Habakkuk says, the just shall live by faith. And he's talking, not talking there about the first step of salvation, to believe in the work of Jesus Christ. He's talking about every step in our lives requires faith. The just shall live by faith. And so entry for the Jews into the promised land was not automatic. It wasn't just going to happen because of gravity. We're standing on one side, we'll stand on the other side. And God instructs 
uh, the, uh, instructs Moses to send out spies into the promised land and to bring back report to convince him this land was truly a land of milk and honey. To convince him that this land was worthwhile. It was a blessed land. It was the land that God promised them. And all the things they heard from their fathers about this land being such a great land that God had promised to be able to see it. And so 12 spies were chosen. And we have this history back in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 and 15, I think. And they went into the promised land, one from each tribe, Caleb and Joshua among them. And 40 days they lived in this land. And they experienced, they saw, they ate, they, they carried back, God's word says, a clump of grapes on two poles between two people. Anyone here got grapes at home, growing grapes at home? Anyone see a clump that hangs from your shoulders down to the ground? That's what they were carrying back into uh, the, the, the camp of Israel on the other side of the Jordan. And this was the land that God said was land of milk and honey. 40, 40 days they were there. And 40 days later they came back to give this report. And the report was, the land is fantastic. It is truly the land of milk and honey that God promised us. It is an amazing land. But we can't go. We can't go because this land has got giants in it. It's got big fortified cities and the ground is unbelievable. It opens up and just swallows its inhabitants. And all of a sudden, uh, the Israelites, God's word tells us that uh, the report from the ten spies that had this negative view of the land was that they turned the hearts of the people against God. And God takes offence because the central issue for God was they don't trust what I've told them. I've told them I'll take them across, I'll fight their battles, no one will be able to stand against them. I've sent them in, they've been there 40 days, they gorge themselves on the fat of the land, they come back and they turn the heart of the people away from me. They don't trust in my faithfulness, in my ability to deliver what I've said. And I won't paraphrase what God says, I'll read it. Numbers 14, 11 says, Now how long, God says, Now how long will these people reject me? It was a rejection of God. That's how God saw it. We might call it a shortcoming, a weakness. We might call it all sorts of things. God says, How long will these people reject me? How long will they not believe me? That's what God saw. That they refused to believe what God said he would do. And as a result of refusing to believe what God said he would do, there was a consequence for the Israelites. They couldn't enter the promised land. They had the name and they had the blessing. The name was that they were the chosen people of God. They had the blessing. They had the promise. They in fact had the only true God compared to what all the other nations worship. They had all the supernatural signs from two or three months earlier, the ten plagues, how they came out of Egypt and how God worked all those miracles to bring them out of Egypt. He looked through them, he looked after them for the short trip during the desert. And now on the banks of the Jordan, about to enter in, they can't believe that God will deliver what he said he was going to deliver. At the end of this long journey, they can't believe that God's going to deliver what he said he was going to deliver. Unfortunately, it took 40 years for the Israelites to learn the important lesson of trusting in God's faithfulness. You know, faith can be very abstract. Some people today say, if you have enough faith, you know, if, you, if you, faith works for you, that's good. But that's not the faith that God calls us to have in him. For this new life as Christians, God calls us to trust in his faithfulness. And trusting in his faithfulness means we believe what he tells us and we do what he tells us. It brings about obedience. For the Israelites, it didn't do any of that. And so we have this history of Israel recorded for us in the Bible as a lesson to all future generations for the Israelites, but also as an important lesson for us. There was a desire to enter the Promised Land, that's for sure. They all looked forward to it. They were all excited about it. The desire was there. But there was not enough faith to trust that God would be able to do it for them. This is a common problem in Christian life. There's a desire to serve God and to love God and to get to know God more and to please God. And we do a lot of those things in our thinking. We want that. 
We may have the desire to do all those things. But if we don't trust him with what he tells us in his word, trust enough to obey what he tells us in his word, our life becomes one of constant misery and failure. And that was what happened to the Israelites. Right till the last point. And then they couldn't trust him to deliver that last bit to cross over the Jordan and give them the promised land. It's a common problem in, in our life as Christians. It's easy to have a desire, but it's hard to trust that God will do what he said he will do. And Paul puts all this together in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39, verses that I've read a number of times from this pulpit. It brings us all together in a way to help us understand that faith doesn't depend on how well life goes. When life goes well, we don't need faith. You don't need faith to know there's problems in the world. You don't need faith to know about sin and salvation, about hell and heaven. You don't need faith for all those things. All we need faith for is to trust that what God says, he will do. And look what Paul says in Romans 8, 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He sets the scene. He says, what can we say for everything we have to face in life? If God is with us, who can possibly be against us? And yet we live in a world and we say the whole world's against us. The government's against us. The, the left thinking is against us. Even the extreme right thinking, everything's against us. Who could be against us, Paul says? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not, with him, also freely give us all things? And if God, who loved the world so much, gave his only son, his only begotten son, if God gave us his own son, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how can he not also, with him, freely give us all things? Is there something that God cannot possibly give us when he's given us the best that he had? And he goes on, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is God who justifies. Who is, he, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore also is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. If there's someone to condemn us, it's God. If there's someone to judge us, it's Jesus Christ. But God gave us his Son, and Jesus Christ is our intercessor. And Paul says, that problem's been taken care of. And he goes on, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Who's going to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? And just to make sure we don't misinterpret what he says as we're not going to face any of these things in our lives, he goes on to say, for your sake we are killed all day long. This is the path of the course for a Christian. That we live in a world full of difficulties, and those difficulties in particular may target us, that's what it means to live in a world that has a different way of thinking to what Jesus Christ calls us. For your sake we are killed all day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet, Paul says, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is a mindset of faith that trusts in God's faithfulness. This is what it means to trust in God's faithfulness. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. We're going to face them, and we might not make, th make it through some of them. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, Paul's conviction and faith were not in how he would be able to make it through all these things. He might be able to escape all these things. He assumed this is what confronted him. His faith and conviction was that God was going to stand true to his promises. That he would never abandon Paul, us. He would never leave us on our own. He would always be there with us. He believed that God would deliver what God had promised. He gave us his son. Was there anything he couldn't give? He's preparing a heavenly home for us. Is there anything that he can't give us? And Paul makes it clear 
But the problem in Christian life is not knowledge. We don't, we're not missing knowledge. Knowledge is easy to come by. The problem, Paul says, is a faith problem. It's a problem about trusting God's faithfulness. And Israel was on the precipice, ready to enter the promised land, ready to dive into the land of milk and honey. And the last thing they needed was a pep talk or another promise from God saying, yeah, I promise you I'll give you this land. They already had all that. They knew that. That's why they were standing there. The last step in the journey was the trust that God would not only take them across the Jordan River, but no one would be able to stand against them because that's what God had said. And it's here that they faltered. Faith is not a requirement for living a miserable life, for living in the desert, for living a life full of pain and suffering. You don't need faith to do that. That's what the world has. That's what the world is. And for a lot of us, that's what we're going to face in the world. We don't need faith to know the promises of God. And you don't need faith to know the word of God either. You don't need faith to understand that you're a sinner in need of salvation. But we need faith to cross the threshold between knowledge and experiencing. No knowledge and living the new life that God has for us. That's what the Israelites lacked. They lacked the faith to trust God and say, you can do it, Lord. You've promised us and you will do it. And as a result, the Israelites ended up spending another 40 years in the desert. 40 long years. And this is where I want us to look at the faith of Caleb and Joshua. It's been a long preamble to get to Caleb and Joshua. But it's important because Joshua and Caleb stood different to the rest of Israel and to the other 10 spies which came back and told them, we can't go in. The place is a terrible place. They stood different. And I want us to understand their trust in God and what that trust in God enabled them to do in their lives. And how we can learn from them, how we can learn to trust God more. And I don't have a secret recipe how you do that. Just to point to what God's word says happens when you trust God in your life, when I trust God in my life, and how that can bring a lot of blessings in our lives and not misery. First thing we see here is that faith focuses our attention on God's promises. We don't see it in this passage, but in the history which leads up to this passage. Faith focuses our attention on God's promises. All 12 spies for 40 days saw everything that was in the promised land. And they carried it back for the rest of Israel to see. And they were amazed by what they saw. All 12 spies did exactly the same thing, but 10 of them focused on the problems. Yes, it's a land full of milk and honey. <coughs> Excuse me. It's a land full of milk and honey, but we can't enter because the problems are too big. As I say, you don't need much faith to see the problems. Anyone can see problems. Without faith, we're we'll surrounded by God's blessings and God's promises, but all we tend to focus on are, are the problems. And many Christians live their lives only focusing on the problems. That's all they can see, the problems around them. Jesus said, just to, as a spoiler alert for those of us who haven't read this verse yet, Jesus said, I'm sure we've all read this verse, in the world you shall have tribulations, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So Jesus Christ tells us that there are problems in life, and we're going to encounter a lot of them. And we can allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the problems that we face, or we can allow ourselves to focus on the promises that God has in his word about life, and our life in particular. And jo Joshua and Caleb saw the promise of God. Yeah, they saw the giants. Uh, Caleb mentions them here in this passage that we read. And they saw all the problems. And they saw the great fortified cities. Again, Caleb mentions those in the passage that we read. But their attitude was, well, God said no one's going to be able to stand against us. Let's go. And that's the attitude we need to have. The problems, absolutely, they're there. And the problems aren't simple. They're complex problems. But if we allow our minds to be preoccupied always with a problem and not with a promise that God gives us in the word, the promises he gives us in his word, that he can help us overcome and be victorious in life, 
we lose sight of the joy that we can have in Jesus Christ. So the first point is that faith focuses our attention on God's promises. The second one is that faith helps us overcome our fears. Now, a lot of these things are easy to say we're not going through a particular problem, so I say that from the outset. Uh, but problems often overwhelm us and fears also uh, overwhelm us uh, after that. And they were paralysed by fear. They saw how wonderful the land was and it was true. What God said about it was true. Uh, but they were paralysed by fear. It was just too hard. It's just too scary. Great fortified cities, giants, etc., etc. And so great was their fear that they thought the 400 years of slavery in Egypt was like a walk in the park because we go back to numbers, they organised a team and said, let's go back to Egypt. At least you know, we had food there. And so they were ready to go back to Egypt. And that's how great their fear was, to go back to the land of slavery, the land that sucked the life out of them, out of their families. Oh, they were more content to be like that than to face the fear of what happens next because they couldn't trust in God's faithfulness. Our mind often plays tricks with us. And we let, our mind, we, let our, we let our minds run away from us. That can often lead us uh, into a lot of fearful thinking. I remember when we were building the camp at Walkerville many years ago. Uh, I think some of the walls were up. I'm not sure we had electricity down there yet. And uh, the truck driver was going to take a whole load of, uh, a semi-trailer load down of wood. Uh, so we started building the frames. And I would have been a uni at some point, I think it was around 20 at the time. And so he needed someone to know the road, how to get there. You know, well, which way do you go? And so I offered, uh, for the day off from uni, to show him the, the way. So we got there around 12, 30, 1 o'clock. I had my old guitar, which I had in a garbage bag because I didn't have a carry case for it, and a big watermelon. And the thinking was I'd go down there and I'd put this watermelon in the creek and it would cool down so when the others came later that night, at least we'd enjoy a nice cold watermelon because it was a very hot day. And so we got there around 12.30, 1 o'clock. By the time we unloaded the truck, it was about 3 o'clock. By the time I went down the creek and brought some bucket loads of water up to cool down this watermelon, it was around 4 o'clock. And then I thought, now what do I do? So I got my guitar out and started playing my guitars. You, you did back then, waiting for the others to come. And so what, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and now what do I do? So I thought, I know it's hot, but a lot of small fire, so at least when they come, we can put something on the fire, we can cook something. And it got to 7 o'clock, and it got to 8 o'clock, and it started getting dark. And so what do you do? Well, I played all the songs on you on the guitar all over again, because that's what you do, just to keep yourself preoccupied. And then it got really dark, and all of a sudden I'm imagining things and seeing things, and what was that noise, and what was the other noise? And I'd heard about these massive goannas, I hadn't seen any of them at that point in time. Maybe that's one of those massive goannas, and so... You know, from being a very confident young man, I became a whimpering mess until about 9.30 when I saw some headlights driving to the campground and I was just so excited to see them. What happened? Was there any wild animals in the bush that were going to attack me? You know, was it some sinister people thought, Philip's down there, let's go and attack Philip? Our mind does that to us. And when we lose sight of what God has promised, our mind will do that to us. The biggest and the most insignificant things all of a sudden become the biggest headaches in our lives, the biggest mountains in our lives. That's what our mind does. And that's what a lack of faith, trust in God does. We can't deal even with the smallest problems in our lives. But that wasn't Caleb and Joshua. Everything was put in the right perspective. Yeah, they're big problems. But God said he would help us conquer and he would drive them all out. Faith also helps us to see the victory that God has promised. This was a promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land of their dreams, the land that God had given them and the land that they were going to conquer. And the ten spies that came back, does anyone remember what they said, how they saw themselves in the land? Does anyone remember? Well, how did they see themselves in the land? God's word tells us, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. And then we looked at the giants and they saw us as grasshoppers. And then we looked at everything else and we saw that the land swallows up its inhabitants and all these great fortified cities and all the rest of it and so many enemies. 
No one can see the victory when we lose sight of what God has promised. They lost sight of what God had promised, that no one would be able to stand against them. And that negativity spread to all of Israel. And there's a verse which I couldn't find the reference to. It says, and they discouraged the hearts of the people. Here, Caleb mentions, and the hearts of the people melted. They discouraged the hearts of the people because instead of looking to the victory that God had promised, they looked to themselves and they were so overwhelmed they saw themselves as grasshoppers. A lack of faith distorts our ability to see the victory that God promises. When Paul says we are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, what does that mean for you? What does it mean for me? I'm more than a conqueror. Do you feel like a conqueror in Jesus Christ? Not at a theoretical level, a theological level, at a practical level in our daily lives. Is that how we feel? Is that how we walk? Is that our attitude as we get up in the morning and say, I'm more than a conqueror in Jesus Christ? I suspect not many of us feel that way when we get up in the morning. We have to face another day, the usual grind. Many Christians live with this type of powerless faith because we can't trust in God's faithfulness. And when you don't trust in God's faithfulness, it's hard to obey God when God says, go. But Lord, and all we see are the problems, all we see are our failures, and we see ourselves as grasshoppers. Their faith was a theoretical one. They had knowledge, but they lacked they lacked life. And that's what happens often in Christian life. We have a lot of knowledge, but we rationalise our faith and says, well, you know, that's true, but, and we start qualifying everything so we don't get uncomfortable with the way we live our lives. And then we rationalise it further and we say, oh, this is just common sense for a Christian. When in reality, it's a lack of trust in God's faithfulness. Faith produces obedience in the face of uncertainty. Yeah, I'm not sure what Abraham was thinking when God said, go sacrifice your son. There's no common sense in that. And there's no way I could think through those words if God said that to me. Uh, you know, I'd find a lot of ways to qualify and say, but Lord, you, know, you don't accept human sacrifices. And Lord, yeah, we could find a lot of reasons, to, a lot of things to qualify with. And we get to Hebrews 11 and we read there that Abraham believed that even if he sacrificed his son, God would resurrect his son. Because God said, through your son, I'll make the father of many nations. God was going to deliver. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to deliver. That's what he's promised. I don't know how Daniel's three friends rationalised their thinking when they had to face the fiery furnace. King, even if our God doesn't save us, we know he can, but even if he doesn't save us, we still won't bow down. Where's the victory in that? How do you view that as being a victorious situation? And yet for Daniel's three friends, it wasn't the logic and it wasn't common sense that prevailed. It was what God said to them. Don't bow to any idols. And there's so many things that God says to us today. Not to bow down to many idols. Be holy for I am holy. Trust means I obey. Do not love the world nor the things of this world. Trust means I obey in what God tells me and what God promises me. And so when we come to Joshua and Caleb, and I've run out of time, they saw and they experienced everything the other ten spies saw and experienced. And God's word says about Caleb when, they, when the spies came back, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. The others saw themselves as grasshoppers. And Caleb said, no, let's go up and get it. We'll overcome it because God had promised. And, and uh, Joshua said, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. We'll have them for breakfast. What does that to people? Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord God is with us. Do not fear them. What enabled to see the inhabitants of the land in this, from this perspective compared to the other ten spies? And let's not guess. Let's get to what God's word says about this. In Numbers 14, 24, God says about Caleb, But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring him to the land where he went 
and his descendants shall inherit it. Caleb had a different spirit. It was the spirit of trusting God and trusting in God's promises. And we see Joshua have the same spirit later. He says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose today whom you're going to serve. They both had this different spirit. And God says in Numbers 14, 30, except for Caleb, the, Je- the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land. The other Israelites were not going to enter the land, only Joshua and Caleb, which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones whom you said would be victims, because I was afraid, what's going to happen to their children? Those little ones whom you said you'll be victims, I will bring in, and thus shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness for forty years, and bear the brunt of your infidelity, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection." And Joshua and Caleb had to suffer along with the rest of the Israelites for 40 years. And after 40 years, we don't see bitterness in them. And we read this conversation that we have here before us, and we don't see any bitterness in them at all. We see a resolve, and especially when Caleb approaches Joshua to say, friend, I'm not coming to you because the two of us made it in, all the other Israelites died in the desert. I'm not coming to you to ask you for a special favour. I'm coming to you, and I'm 85 years old now, I was 40 back then, but I still have the same strength and resolve and faith in the God who promised, that he promised me that he would give me this land. Which land did he ask for? Which land was promised to Caleb? It wasn't some beautiful place near the river, minimum effort. He comes to Joshua and says, give me my mountain. In verse 14, uh, verse 12 of the chapter we're reading. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you have heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. This was a mountain that scared the Jews. This is where the giants lived on this mountain. This is where the fortified cities were. This is where the Jews or the spies stood and saw themselves as grasshoppers. And Caleb says, give me my mountain. The spirit that he had 45 years earlier, which God rewarded, the same spirit still. And if God wills, I will drive them out. The same trust in God's faithfulness. And if it's God's will, I'll live in that mountain. Joshua, give me my mountain. Before us in life, we have many mountains to climb. And there's a lot of giants that scare us. There's a lot of areas which seem to be off bounds for us and we just can't make any headway with, the fortified cities. And the only way we can get ahead in these areas in life is to believe what God says through Paul. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. To trust in God's faithfulness and to allow God to use us in the way that God can to bring about whatever it is that God wants to bring about in our lives. And not to cower and be afraid. And not to hide and feel like grasshoppers. Sometimes I listen to Richard Dawkins and how he just pours so much scorn on Christianity. I I struggle just now. What words would you... Don't worry about it. Trust in God. He's one of the giants that the world looks to today for some sort of strength against religion, against Christianity. God calls us to look to him. Not to take the fight to Richard Dawkins or anyone else in this world, but to be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ because God has promised that to each of us. How nice it would be for all of us to have this spirit that Joshua and Caleb had and to be able to stand and stand confident, not in our abilities, not because we have a blinkered view of how good we are, but because God has said, we can be more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. May God interpret this word, this message more into our hearts and give to each of us according to our needs and bless us for his glory.